search for a sustainable peace, social stability, and an end to the Boko Haram conflict came transitional justice and reconciliation. It is a globally accepted mechanism with diverse approaches towards promotion of justice, prevention of human rights violations, and entrenchment of institutional reforms for democracy to thrive. As a post-conflict measure, governmental and non-governmental organizations are working in harmony with communities, traditional, religious institutions, police and the military in a peace-building initiative that has worked in many conflict-ridden nations. Transitional justice is central to continental efforts in developing homegrown strategies peculiar to communities and circumstances to achieve peace. How is the Transitional Justice and Reconciliation Initiative working in the Northeast for the achievement of a lasting peace. This is our focus on Panorama this afternoon from the studios of NTMW Network Center. I am. Two dead bodies have so far been recovered from a seven story building still under construction at Oba. Oneiro Street, Victoria Island, Lagos, which carved in the early hours of Sunday morning. According to eyewitnesses, the building showed warning signs in the early hours of Sunday morning, which prompted some construction workers. About nine were sudden in the building to escape, but at about two in the morning, there was a race against time by emergency responders to rescue more persons trapped in the building, while at the same time intensifying operations to evacuate rebels to ground zero. Heavy duty tools and equipment have been deployed to the scene to hasten the process. Residents of the area said construction of the affected structure began last year but still undergoing before collapsing. Away from that unfortunate incident now, the Nigerian Navy ship Victory of the Eastern Naval Command has intercepted and handed over a suspicious truck laden with an unspecified amount of automated gas oil to the Cross River Command of the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps. Maureen Leo Ajon completes the story. Deep zero tolerance and economic sabotage, especially oil pegs, the MNS Victory Calabar. 33,000 meter truck laden with unspecified quantity of automated gas oil along Harbour Junction, a route leading to NNPC Depot, Calabar. NNS Victory Calabar Base Intelligence Officer who handed over the seized truck to the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps said the truck driver escaped, leaving the truck behind as soon as the truck was spotted. Whatever feats we have achieved is in line with the Chief of Nova South Strategic Directive that is being um, channeled by the Flag Officer Commanding Eastern Nova Command and also implemented by the Commander and the Navy Ship Victory. So, and all these, they have states their resilience to stamp out criminality and legalities within an NS Victory area of responsibility and Eastern Nova Command area of responsibility in general. We find out that, yes, we don't have pipelines, but the channels we have, the water channels, are the channels that are always used to smuggle this product. The synergy has really, really helped us so much in reducing oil theft. The Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps noted that the synergy with other security agencies, especially the Nigerian Navy, has gone a long way to reduce oil theft and other forms of economic sabotage in the country, while promising to carry out proper investigation into the matter in Calabar Marilio Ajon and the news command of the Nigeria Customs Service has in the month of August intercepted contrabands worth about 100 million naira including cannabis sativa and foreign fertilizer among other sensitive items 
The controller of the command, Joseph Atta, stated this at the end of the month press briefing. Abu Bakr Garba Digi's report is here presented. As the command heightened its anti smuggling offensive against smugglers and engaged in strategic meetings with traditional rulers and other organizations aimed at changing the narratives as far as fighting smuggling is concerned. This, he noted, led to the seizure of assorted contrabands and improved the revenue generation in the command. Said 389 wraps of cannabis, 20,600 liters of premium motor spirit, 75 bags of fertilizer concealed in an animal feed sacks, 22 bags of foreign parboiled rice, vegetable oil, sugar and others were intercepted. He appealed to the parents of youths who fraternize with smugglers and frustrate men of the command in carrying out their legitimate duty to desist from the act, that it is prehensible and punishable under the laws of the country. I hope that people listen to this respected um, elders and go out with this emerging community of uh, supporting smugglers against the great authorities. Receiving the seized cannabis sativa, the commandant of National Drugs Law Enforcement Agency, Kebi State, commanded the effort and called for improved synergy among sister agencies. This is you can appreciate the area controller and his management team for the synergy and cooperation that has been existing among security agencies in KB State and particularly for their efforts in the fight against stroke owners. Protocol the quest for a long lasting and inclusive peace to the troubled Northeast, Alamein Foundation for Peace and Development, and other partners initiated the Transitional Justice and Reconciliation Project. All of such peace building efforts are advocacy visits to traditional institutions, religious, community organizations, and the military for continued development of civil military relationship. Abdul Zakari will not bring us more details of the story. More than 67,000 repentant terrorists and their families have surrendered to Nigerian armed forces to date as stakeholders seek solution on the way forward. Al Amin Foundation, one of such stakeholders, has been in direct contact with affected communities since the onset of insurgency through its numerous programs that seek aid and justice for victims. Al Amin Foundation took its message of advocacy to Theater Command of Russia Hatman Kai where the executive director, Hafsatu Al Amin, spoke on the programs for widows and orphans, mothers seeking release of detained sons, and children born in the soldiers' camp, among others. Hafsat Al Amin appreciated the theater commander and senior officers for the efforts being put forth in seeking peace. We are now working with partners who are willing, who are ready to cooperate and work with us. Theater commander of the Shahad and Kai, Major General Christopher Musa, explained that as the military seeks peace, it is therefore happy to work with peacemakers. We have a lot of victims. This foundation takes care of these victims. Partners of al Amin Foundation, Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office, FCDO, were also present. Stakeholders seek ways to address the issue of repentant combatants as 30,000 victims of insurgency are already registered with al Amin Foundation. In Meduguri, Abdul Zakari, MTA News. Talking about the protracted Boko Haram conflict of more than a decade, transitional justice and reconciliation became a product of necessity in the search for a lasting peace. The Oputa panel, short and reconciliation commissions of rivers and ocean states, are some examples of the peace building initiatives for social stability in Nigeria. With me in the studio to discuss this or this peace building efforts rather, is the Executive Director, Alamin Foundation for Peace and Development, Hamsatu Alamin. Executive Director, it's a pleasure to have you on panel this afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. All right, let's begin this way. What is the purpose and objective of transition and reconciliation in relation to the strife for restoration of, you know, enabling peace? Well, um... As I said earlier, in fact, um, most Eastern Nigeria has been living through a campaign of terror for the past 13 years. 
and then which has generated a lot of humanitarian and social crises. And then the requirements of the, uh, the SDG 2030 Sustainable Development Goal Agenda, um, uh, goal number 16, talks about the provision of sustainable fees and then inclusivity as a prerequisite aim of the SDG, which advocated for the establishment of effective, accountable and inclusive system across. And then in the wake of this development, now we come across the return or surrender, mass surrender of these boys, Boko Haram fighters, in tens of thousands to the hands of the uh, uh, state authorities. Authorities who are at a fix as to what or how to do with this massive number of surrender, uh, surrenders. And then the society itself is engulfed in apprehension, fear, and then concerns to these surrenders while they themselves have been battling with the effects or impacts of this insurgency in its multiple forms. And then looking at the normal justice system of how long, where I shall affected and then impacted people go to seek justice. And then coupled, what messed up and made the whole thing is the absence, in spite of a numerous a number of humanitarian and both national and international actors on ground, there are no victims or survivors or affected people centered interventions on ground where victims can get sucker. So in view of this, looking at all this, it is just at that transitional justice that had been tested elsewhere in such, uh, this kind of settings be applied in our context too, where people can come, tell the truth, and then um, uh, justice could be meted to both the perpetrator and then the victims, and then reparations be paid, and then eventually the government can guarantee non occurrence of the situation that has brought us into this. Hence, our aim is to gather stakeholders so as to understand, to educate stakeholders on the need for this transitional justice and then also gather their perspectives and insights and preconditions for peace and reconciliation in a context where everybody claims to be a victim. This is in fact the aim of transitional justice in, as we practice it here. That's good to hear. Okay, now tell us, how much has the foundation achieved working with critical stakeholders in the search for peace we, in the North and the Northeast? We have worked across all stakeholders, state and non-state actors, traditional rulers, including military, community leaders, affected persons, and what have you. And wherever we go, honestly, we are welcome. Everybody is welcome of the uh, welcome the idea of the transitional justice. Why? Because people are wary of the the complex situation. Mm. Even the military itself welcomes the idea of peace building. So therefore, wherever we go, people give us their perspectives, gives a lot of insight, which has in fact even widened our scope of understanding of the magnitude of the problem that we have at hand. So in fact, stakeholders have responded, and then they are giving very good feedback to us where in fact when we go, as I said earlier, even the military itself that you consider to be our protectors and so sometimes they call themselves they are also victims and really they can see you can see the real victims in them uh, even the Boko Haram uh, boys themselves they claim to be victims themselves while at the community across from everybody from the big and then to the smallest everybody is a victim so in this context it is only through transitional justice can people understand each other that they can come, reach common grounds, and then forgive each other, maybe perhaps live amicably in peace. All right, Executive Director, you know, from your engagements with communities, organizations, and of course, victims of insurgency, how can we surmount challenges in the way of this laudable project? Well, the challenges is in fact, um, as it is only we as civil society actors and others who are in part talking about the justice and then the affected people themselves. Government is yet to key in into this aspect of transitional justice. That is, I think, the major challenge. And then our aim now is to in part mobilize all stakeholders, educate them, understand, including the government actors. For example, Borno State has a, its own Bor uh, plan, which they call the Borno model of reintegration. But that Borno model is of integration, much it is beautiful and then all inclusive, but 
that aspect of victims and then their relations and then other perpetrators because the perpetration of violence in the context of Boko Haram insurgency is both sides from both the street counter, um, counter terrorism operatives as well as the insurgents themselves. So it is a two way. So therefore, in the middle, government has to key in, understand, and then combine, uh, get the relevant right stakeholders to sit down and then design an approach that where everybody can key in so that justice and reconciliation can be. Okay, at this point, I'd like to say a very big thank you to the Executive Director and the Main Foundation for Peace and Development, Hamsat Alamin, for being part of Panorama this afternoon. Thank you very much. We appreciate you so much. Let us at this point take a break, but we have another set of stories for you as soon as we return. The vaccine offers hope for a safe country through the coronavirus. I urge all state governments, traditional and religious leaders, to take the lead in the mobilization effort within their environment and spheres of influence. I similarly urge all eligible Nigerians to present themselves and be vaccinated in accordance with the order of priority already mapped out at the various authorized designated centers only. back on panorama let's move on now religious and community leaders youth and women groups in the new state are being mobilized to play their part in the reintegration of children and low-risk repentant combatants in their various communities this came up during a consultative meeting with the stakeholders jointly organized by the Bermuda state ministry of local government and emirate affairs and that of women affairs and social development in collaboration with UNICEF. Milka Damalab completes the story. United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, funded by European Union, have continued to support Burma State Government in the implementation of numerous activities across the state. The program attracted community and religious leaders, youth and women groups in various communities of Burma, Kondiga, Marfa, Jikwa, Jere, Goza, and MNC local government areas of Burma State. Chief of Meiju Greenfield Office, Paul Tenguyen noted that the support and influence of religious leaders is necessary, hence the need for the program to orient the participants on reconciliation and reintegration, as well as assure the organization's continuous support to Borno State Government. It is very important that we are working with the religious leaders to make sure that they embrace these children formerly associated with armed groups uh, to come back into the community and to be accepted by the community. UNICEF, Edwin Dobor, Project Assistant IOM, Mohammed Nasser, and Community Security Analyst Usman Usman, during their presentations, urged participants to raise awareness in the community, places of worship and youth centers, and sensitize the community on acceptance and mitigation of stigmatization of ex-combatants, and assured that the organization will continue to render support to UNICEF to achieve its sex objectives. Issues raised by the participants during discussion session were major challenges associated with reintegration, but they promised to put in their best towards achieving the desired goal. Communication specialist UNICEF, Panchanan Achari, thanked the Bono State Ministries of Local Government and Emirate Affairs and that of Women Affairs and Social Development, as well as the participants for their continuous collaboration. In my degree, Milka Lamalam, NTA News. Flooding, a global phenomenon, is causing untold hardship on human communities with lives, properties, and other means of living lost to the forces of nature. Here in Bermuda State, particularly Meliburi, the state capital, flash floods and river channels overtaking their banks are increasing the risk of more disaster in low-lying communities. Nurjanit Hassan will now give us an update. Maiduguri is under siege from flash floods and overflowing of two rivers. With me for an update on the situation is the chairman, Borno State Committee on Flood Control, Kakashuk Lawan. Uh, sir, what is the flood situation like at the moment? Well, the situation is relatively calm but highly unpredictable. 
Yes. By river Angada now. The river banks are completely filled up with water. The committee has gone down to look at flash points and vulnerable areas with a view to finding a solution on how to avert possible flooding in the metropolis and its environs. To set the ball rolling, we have identified an emergency center in case of an unforeseen event. We were reliably informed that the volume of the water flowing from the two rivers, coupled with the fact that River Kiri in Adama or Nabdo in Cameroon is likely to be opened anytime soon. So, in case we are faced with an emergency situation, the state government has put in place all measures. Uh, sir, what immediate and short term measures are put in place to control flooding? When the state government prior to the commencement of rainy season has embarked on the silting of waterways as well as evacuation of all drainages with a view to allowing free flow of water in metropolis and its environs as a long as a short term solution. We have equally dredged the waterways along the river banks to ensure that the rivers flow without uh, much hindrance. These are the short term plan we have. As regards the long term plan, there are residential buildings that are constructed along the waterways which the state government must study carefully and find a last lasting solution to that. That, if implemented, we are going to uh, be free from flooding in the recent, uh, in the coming years by the grace of God. Thank you very much, sir. Flooding is a current seasonal phenomenon in Borno. It is our hope that a final solution is found. It is back to you in the studio. Thank you, Mr. Jana, too. And still on issues that have to do with the forces of nature, in the search for durable and lasting solution to flood disaster, the Real State Urban Planning and Development Board has conducted assessment visits to areas of Niliguri, the state capital, ravaged by the environmental concerns. The assessment visit to areas badly affected by the flash floods and increased volume of the two rivers passing through Niliguri Township followed a directive by Governor Babagana Umarazulu, the report. Specific communities within Niduguri Metropolitan Council and Jerry have continued the menace of flood, resulting to loss of lives as well as property. Worried by this unfortunate natural phenomenon that compelled Governor Babagana Umara to make on the spot assessment recently, General Manager, the Roasted Urban Planning and Development Board, Kakamal Umar, deemed it a matter of utmost importance to assess flooded areas as well as those that are prone to avert further devastation. Areas visited by the general manager include 505 housing estate, Shirari 1, 2 and 3, Gomari Airport, Kushari behind Sibian quarters and Modgonari behind Indonesia residents. At Modgonari, where residents are vacating their houses, Kakamal and Umar comes rated with victims. He is going to do underground infrastructure where all the water flowing is collected, is being collected into a tunnel. While at Shuari 1, the residents appealed for linking of the large volume of water with the reservoir in the area as remedy. In other areas, the inhabitants expressed willingness for government to demolish structures built on waterways, while others suggested that the major rivers like Ugangada be brought further. The Urban Planning and Development Board is expected to interface with the State Committee for the Control of Flood on the matter, after which it will present an interim report to the Governor. And on to some sporting action with a special on gymnastic. If George is our guide on sports update. 11-year-old Stephanie Onusurika Standing spectators at the just concluded Africa Club Gymnastics Championship in South Africa. This has been quite a remarkable journey and a steady rise to stardom through hard work and determination. At the tender age of two, she had shown signs of great flexibility, which indicated the potential in gymnastics. Despite being skeptical at first, her parents encouraged her and took her to a gymnastic club at the National Stadium Abuja.
to hone her skills. So notice she likes gymnastics. She was always unusual at home. Her mood, she doesn't work normally like a normal child. So we decided to nurture the talent by allowing her to watch some YouTube videos. The TIG Gymnastics Club at the National Stadium did not only develop her talent, but gave her a platform.